Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Justin Ozakovitz from the University of Alberta and co-director of the Canadian Vigor Center. I'm joined by Dr. Eileen O'Meara from the Montreal Heart Institute, who's my co-chair of the Canadian Heart Failure Guidelines. Today we're going to be talking about 10 years of guidelines and what we've learned and how we've done it. We want people to understand the guideline process because it's extremely vigorous, it's voluntary, and it's really developed over the last 10 years as the Canadian Cardiovascular Society has taken hold of how we do our Canadian guidelines so we can practice better and provide our patients with the best possible care. It's a highly rigorous process, and to do this we have to evaluate lots of evidence and sometimes come to expert opinion as to what's best for a clinical scenario. So sometimes where there is no evidence, we have to think about it carefully. Sometimes where there's overwhelming evidence, we can provide very strong guidance. Here are our disclosures. First of all, most of you refer patients or see patients in a very complicated way. You sometimes initially see patients who are in the outpatient world and electively seeing them, or sometimes very acutely. So what we've come up with is a very simple way of thinking about the initial referral, and then how fast do you have to see that patient. First of all, if you look at the very top, you'll see in the green, as in the lowest risk patients that we usually see, are outpatient elective referrals, and those are often patients who are NYHA class 2 in their symptomatology, or sometimes NYHA class 1 and they need further evaluation. Those patients can often be seen in 12 weeks, or ideally in 6, but we understand that they have a lower urgency. As you go down through the yellow and then orange and red, you'll identify that these patients are of increasing urgency and obviously need to be seen in a timely fashion. And we have some different time zones in which you have to see them, sometimes within four weeks, two weeks, or within 24 hours. At all times, you should be making that best clinical judgment, but be guided by their overall risk, but also their symptomatology and how urgently you have to have them seen by a specialist care as well as their primary care. When we see patients in clinic, we often have to make a decision about the next step of therapy. In patients with heart failure, echocardiogram has been our go-to in terms of the diagnosis or evaluation of structure and function for heart failure. So on this table, you'll see that when patients have new onset heart failure, we do want patients to have an early and relatively immediate echocardiogram within the first two weeks of diagnosis or thinking it's heart failure. That's achievable in most places in Canada, but not all, and we understand there are some limitations. While echocardiograms are the recommended first modality of, of imaging, others can be chosen, such as MUGA, cardiac MRI, and even others in consideration that you do need to do this relatively urgently. On the flip side, when patients are done up titrating their medical therapy, so triple therapy has been instituted and a, a person is on those appropriate therapies, then three months really is the right time window after that completion of therapy to reevaluate with an echocardiogram, and ideally done at the same institution with the same readers or same group of readers so you can really compare what has changed in the same uh, way. We definitely want this to be sorted by a numerical quantification with the current technology that is highly possible. And that should be something like Simpson's method or another appropriate quantification method. Once people are relatively stable and they've gone on to their therapy and they're doing well, repeating the echocardiogram every two to three years is reasonable. And especially this can be deferred if the ejection fraction is either recovered or it's been preserved all along. And then choosing a modality that's appropriate for that patient and also being able to look at the previous echocardiograms or other imaging is quite important. On the flip side, if somebody is decompensated, you certainly want to think about repeating the imaging because there's often a reason they've decompensated that you may not be aware of. And, and something quick like an echocardiogram can help give us a, a window into what has happened. So looking at that in, in a relatively short time frame is quite important. So in terms of management strategy, I'll ask Eileen to talk about therapy. Thank you, Justin. So there's uh, what we proposed in the companion to uh, the heart failure guidelines, and you can find all the details in that text. But with, for patients with LVEF of 40% or less and symptoms of heart failure, we first recommend uh, to start triple therapy uh, and uh, to titrate that to the maximum tolerated dose or evidence-based dose. And this, of course, includes ACE inhibitors or ARBs if ACE intolerant, beta blockers, and MRAs. Why we put MRAs there? It's because there's enough evidence in that low EF group, even in preserved EF, although this is not the algorithm for that. But uh, there's evidence after MI, there's evidence in severe heart failure, and there's evidence in less advanced heart failure in YHA class 2. And so, all the, the patients should be on that triple therapy first. And then we reassess symptoms. And if the patient has, has NYHA class 1, you continue triple therapy. 
If NYG class is 2 to 4 in sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 70 beats per minute or more, add Evabradine should be considered if and when available in Canada. Also consider switching the ACE or ARB to Secubitril Valsartan after the results of the Paradigm HF uh, trial for eligible patients. If NYHA is 2 to 4 in sinus rhythm but with a heart rate below 70 or an atrial fibrillation or the patient has a pacemaker, then you consider switching the ACE or ARB to Secubitril Valsartan again according to the Paradigm HF trial results. Then you reassess symptoms and that's the moment to redo, uh, remeasure LVEF. And if NYJ class is 1 with LVEF above 35%, you continue the same management and reassess every 1 to 3 years or with a change in clinical status as Justin men mentioned before. If NYG is 1 to 3 and LVEF of 35% or, le or less, then you consider ICD and or CRT and refer to the appropriate guidelines uh, from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society for that and consider LVES, uh, LVEF reassessment every one to five years. If NYG class is four, then maybe consider hydralazine nitrates and obviously consider referral for advanced heart failure therapy in terms of mechanical circulatory support or transplant. And the advanced heart failure team should be um, contacted if the patient is considered for that kind of procedure. Then you reassess as needed according to clinical status. Can I ever stop heart failure therapy is a frequently asked question. And we propose here five types of cardiomyopathies or conditions where this would be appropriate if NYG class is one. And we've also included some other criteria. And I won't name everything on that slide, but just to say this would be for tachycardia related cardiomyopathy, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, chemotherapy related cardiomyopathy, peripartum cardiomyopathy, or after valve replacement surgery. And among the criteria that we've included in the comments, um, you can consider LV dimensions, namely. And I will turn back to Justin for the conclusion. Okay. Thanks, Eileen. So thanks for joining us today. We're going to have a number of different modules come out over the coming period of time that'll be uh, based on our upcoming 2016-17 Canadian Cardiovascular Heart Failure Guidelines. They are really built off 10 years of guidelines and the modules we created within those at 30 years of experience and practice and evidence that has accrued over that time. So thanks very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.